Hi, this is the Ultimate Sports Network Real Boxing Talk. I'm trying to avoid saying the same thing every time, so there we go. All right. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, it's been an interesting aftermath of, of obviously the Fury Wilder rage and then what's coming up. But And John mentioned something as we were off the air that's something that flew under the radar. Um, John, go ahead and, and mention that thing again so people can understand what's happening. Well, everybody has an opinion about Deontay Wilder, as we know, and most of it is pretty negative, to be honest. I mean, he did gain a lot of newfound respect from people. You saw the old, well, I don't like the guy, but he really put it on the line against right. Fury, and he lost. And then Fury says, hey, I went over there to congratulate, or to congratulate him for his effort, and he didn't want anything to do with me. He didn't say congratulations to me, blah, the dozer, blah, 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 blah. So then some of that went down again because he wasn't being a good sport. And as we know, last week, Charles and I were talking about, we were talking about, I went, well, I might've been called a bad sport myself. If you talk. So I kind of got it. I did. I, I remember like Frank Robinson used to say, you guys remember this. Uh, he would say, be over there shaking hands with that loser for you. you're going to play <laughs> against him. Right, yeah. Friendly. You know, and I mean, I got that. I did. I played very hard when I was a kid. I, I wasn't buddy-buddy with somebody. After the game, when we're out of there, okay, I'll be buddy-buddy. But before the game and during the game, uh-uh. You know, you're the enemy. That was that was my mindset. So I got it with Wilder. I didn't say it was right. I just, I mean, I even got it with John McEnroe, Frank, when he used to say, right. oh, yeah. you know, because I was very competitive. And I, when somebody would do something, I'd get mad. I was more mad at myself than anything else. So I got it. So. Wilder puts out a statement, a very classy statement saying, I did my best, blah, 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 and I don't remember it all, but, uh, and congratulations to Tyson Fury on your victory. Uh, and it was like, you know, silence. There was barely anything. And I can blame myself, too. I didn't, I didn't think I needed to, but maybe I, I should have <clears throat> put something on Max Boxing about it. I did not. Apparently, a lot of people didn't see it. You guys saw it. I'm really glad. But uh, you know, we, we've got to give Wilder. We're all, not us, but so many people are so quick to blame him and, and point fingers at him and call him names. If somebody does something right, like they most did after the fight, they gave him his, his credit. you got to give him credit for this because people were joking on, online that, oh, what's he going to blame this time? What's the excuse? He didn't blame right, anything. Right. He just said, I did, I did the best I could, and, and congratulations to Tyson Fury. So, you know, that, that was good. That was classy. He's, he's uh, got checked out of the hospital. He's not retiring. He's, he's, they're already talking about his next fight. So onward we go. Well, Charles, and, and you and I know this from experience, our own experiences, that you need a cooling off period after you're in the midst of something like that, especially something with all the buildup and all the hype of all that. So let's say we were playing at the Y, just as an example. And we would get done and it was like, okay, you know, we had the gym for an hour, however long we had it for. Like, we're done. Okay, let's go get a beer. But that was the cooling off period. While you were playing, you weren't thinking about, hey, if someone said, where are we going to go after, the, after we're done? It's like, we're not done yet. We're still playing. When we are done playing, when we are done with our gym time, then we will discuss that. And and I think that that's kind of where Wilder was. Now, I'm oversimplifying, obviously, but mm -hmm. there is a point where you aren't, you are, even though the match is done, the fight is over with, you're still in the fight, correct? No doubt. I agree with that 100%. Plus, too, we had to be, we had to be honest about this. There were some things that were said by, uh, Fury about Wilder, and they kind of went back at it. And right. while Fury, Fury is a, a a type of person that is a, you know, he plays try to play with you mental mentally as well, try to get inside your head, and maybe some of the stuff he really did mean, or it was just kind of taken out of context a lot of it by even some of his people in his uh, camp. He probably oftentimes probably didn't mean everything, but some of that stuff probably still stung, and it stung even more when Wilder lost. And then to after you lose, right afterwards, it's like, hey, we're pals. And it's like, I just lost to this dude. I lost to the third time. I'm thinking about all the work I put into it. And you want to come over and, act like, and give me a hug, like everything is, is happy, you know, hunky-dory. 
I'm like, mother, get out of my, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Know, seriously. Right. I mean, give, give, me, give me a moment. I mean, be a, be, a, be a real gracious champion. Don't come over telling me, oh, it's a shame that you lost the way that you, I don't need to hear that bull stuff. I don't want to yeah. hear that crap. So let me, as you said, give me a moment or a little time to kind of get my thoughts together. Let me breathe. Let me put it all in perspective and I'll come back. I don't owe you anything to go, oh, I'm supposed to be happy that you beat me. No, that ain't going to never happen. Even even if they, when a kid, they used to make you shake hands, I hated that. Yeah. Yeah, go down the line like in basketball. Then they they tap you on the shoulder. Don't touch me. (laughs) Don't touch me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you beat me by 29. I don't want to hear that. I'm humiliated. I'm just witness practice. So, no, I agree with you 100%. I think that uh, people that are really coming after him because he wasn't a good sport, that's the problem with the world now. We got too many damn good sports, in my opinion, and everybody gets a participation trophy. Life is hard, bro. It's not like that. So, nah. We teach we teach kids something different. You really want to carry the brass wing, you got to work for it. You got to work hard. Even if you come up short, you need your best effort. And still be competitive. And I think that's who Wilder was. That's a lot. Think about it now. When we first started this trilogy, Wilder was the man. Right. He was undefeated. He thought he just was going to get rid of this overweight, over out of shape, Gypsy King, and knock him the hell out and move on. Now he had a draw and two incredible major losses for a person that was undefeated when he first started. Now you lose basically, some people say he lost three straight. Not easy thing to do when you're the type of athlete that he is. Well, and John, I look back at the the the, the, the preamble, the, the lead up of all of this, and yes, it's the Celtics, it's marketing. I understand that, but when it gets personal, even though both of you may understand that it's not supposed to be personal, it gets personal. And I go to the Ali Frazier thing when Ali the gorilla in Manila and all that, and you're like, now I think he's being playful, but he's talking about me. And it took Frazier a while to be able to forgive that because, and and it's not, you know, hey, the fight's over. I was just joking, Joe. Like, no, you talk shit about me for a long time leading up to this and in a very disparaging way. And if I'm not in on the, on the, on the PR part of this, and just suddenly, here I am on the Mike Douglas show, and you're like, oh, wait a second. So I can see where where Wilder's like, I don't know about this. Yeah, and, and yeah, with Ali, you know, that, there's no doubt. I mean, we love him, but he crossed the line with Joe Frazier. He, he, and we all know it. We weren't we're not happy about it. You read it, you kind of, Muhammad, you know, and I think he knew it. And I actually, from everything I've read, I don't think Joe Frazier totally forgave him for yeah. that for the rest of his life. I mean, he would go through periods where he was okay. And then he would get mad all over again. Somebody remind him of it. And, and now he paid for it. I mean, he fired up Joe Frazier, just like that old thing. We say right. he made him more determined. Right. And in a way, Fury was more, I mean, a Wilder was more determined in the third fight because of what had happened in the second fight. So in a sense, you could say that Fury could pay for it. Remember he got knocked down twice. It looked good a couple of times. And, you know, I read something kind of compared to this. It's very interesting is, you know, we do love it when there's good when there's good sportsmanship. There is. We talk on this, we say this, but then when you see two guys who can do that, they're they're they got their they're going the gun guys holding the guy's arm up, you know. Yeah. I mean, and that's usually because it hasn't got personal between them. It was it was a job. They looked at it as a job. We fought each other as hard as we can. You won. Congratulations. You can do that. I don't even know if I could have done that. To be honest, even if I didn't, even if I liked the guy personally, I don't think I'd be running over to him to give him a hug and everything. I'd be standing over there stewing for a while. So that what you said is right. I would have needed some cooling off time. I would have needed my corner to say something or me to walk around the ring a little bit. Because the fight's over by that point, and, and I don't hate this guy. Now, if I had something personal against the guy, it's different. Real quick, there's been a lot of talk from this trainer that, that, that I really uh, respect named up. Uh, Red, Red Man. Uh, he trains Julian Williams, by the way, who I might, might mention later, and other fighters. He said that something about Anthony Joshua that I, that I had thought about, but it was, wasn't uh, smart enough to say it. He said that, Ant- get this, Anthony Joshua loses too easy. 
He looks too happy after the fights when he loses. But this is kind of connected to what we're saying. Yeah. And he said that Wilder reacted the way that he thought a, a pro champion yeah. would act. Angry, disappointed, get out of my face. So he agrees with us. He, he feels like Joshua is too easy going about it. Like, ah, you know, it's all right. I'll get him in a rematch. And he's like, mm -hmm. so he has a doubt about the commitment. We've had that. We've said that ourselves on this show. Right, right. So there you go. I mean, it kind of ties in. I mean, everybody's different. Joshua thinks he can flip a switch on. Well, his, his his mentality is totally different than a lot of what, what, what ways we see it. Well, Charles, let's carry that a step further, and and let's look at um, one of my favorite reporters, Jim Gray. And Jim Gray sticks the microphone in your face at the most well used to anyway at the most inopportune times. And expect you to give a classic, fantastic answer. And this is the new media now. Now, I know I'm going back ways with Jim Gray, and you can mention any of those interviews that he's done. But this is the classic, the, the traditional media as opposed to what we're seeing now. All right, it's the middle of the game. Let's talk to the, you know, it's halftime of the football game. Let's talk to Nick Saban coming off the field why his team, when his team just gave away, you know, two possessions. What do you think you're going to get from Nick Saban or Bill Belichick at that point? Well, he was awfully curt and rude. Well, yeah. Well, what did you expect? You know, you stick a microphone in my face at this point, point in the game when I'm not happy about what's going on. So when we're looking at something like this, should we expect anything different from that? I know that we're, we're looking at it from our point of view as competitors, but why do we do that? Why is that the new media? We need to get this answer from him right away. Well, I mean, I think because everybody's trying to, they're, they're trying to get that sensational point, right? They want to be sensational. They want to be fabulous. And that's the way with the new media. And they're always trying to bring out dirt or something that's going to bring up views and make people go, ooh, did you see that? Did you yeah. click, click? It's all about just click, clicker mentality. Right. Click, 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 click. How many views? How many clicks? How much money can I make? If, I, if I'm the first with some BS that everybody knows is wrong, but I was first. I wasn't right. Uh, first, and and the thing going back to Jim Gray, the problem people had with Jim Gray was it wasn't a factor that he was putting the microphone in the person's face at the time. He would just ask some asinine questions at the time, and that's totally that's a whole different ball game. If you ask me, so what do you think the problem was? Okay, that might piss you off a little bit, but when he's asking some stuff that he knows is really monumental and starts digging, then it's like. You're looking at him like, I'm not answering that question. And then he looks at you like, you owe me to answer that right, question, which right. really pisses the athletes off. It's like, I don't owe you any damn thing because the reason why you're here is because I'm the I'm the show. Right. And that's what, you know, that's what Floyd Mayweather said when he said to, uh, you know, Christian. yeah, yeah, yeah. When he says, you know, it's like, hey, he says, you don't know she's my box. Basically, you got to <laughs> give me a fair shake. And he says, but really telling me you're trying to come at me because you're trying to conduct an interview and they've told you these questions or you have it in your mind that right. I should answer what you want me to the way you want me to when truth be told you can ask it but to get an attitude like the person owes you you know like well no don't don't get off of it you said that well stick to the to the plan okay that's great because y'all paying for the money but at the end of the day it's still the athlete that is the game. They are the prize. They're the reason why we're here. So you have a job to do. Doesn't mean you're going to get the answer you're looking for. The other thing, too, very quickly is the fact that they don't owe you a damn thing. You may believe that, but they don't. It's like what they asked, kept asking Kyrie about the vaccination situation. They've heard about it, flipped like nine times. He said, I told y'all it's a private matter. I don't want to talk about it anymore. And then they even have well, SAA is made for the same pilots like Matt, who can come to a stop. Oops. All righty, nicely. All right. They, <laughs> okay. they, they My instructors went off on us. They did. They they even have a they even had a, a a lady, a nice woman on ESPN that he's fond of at come back with another question. And he kind of got a little perturbed at her, like I just told you, you doing the same thing. So the premise of it is is just the fact that I, I think that uh like I said, it's all about the clicks. 
It's all about people trying to be VIP, trying to be famous, trying to be the person that broke the story when you don't have to be a true, true journalist. But I think some of the uh, your your professional athletes are like, you want to be an ass like that now? I'm going to be an ass right back. And, and that's what you're seeing more and more of those athletes now shooting back at them. Like, I don't owe you anything. Well, it's a, it's a double-edged sword here because we're looking at, you know, they're getting paid an exorbitant amount of money because of the coverage they receive. Mm -hmm. But you're thinking, so in order to get paid that amount of money, you have to be willing to deal with the coverage. So if you're not willing to deal with the coverage, then what are you getting paid for? That's where the money's coming in. You know, you're looking at, and I'm going to go way afield here, you're looking at a Subway commercial with multimillionaires on it. It's like Tom Brady, Serena Williams, and Steph Curry do not need to make any more money from this stupid Subway commercial. And Charles Barkley, for that matter. You know, Steph Curry just signed a quarter of a billion dollar contract. Does he really need to be endorsed in some way? So why do you do it? Because that's part of the personality of who you are. Hey, I'm on a national subway commercial. Maybe I don't really know the, the motivation behind it, but it's the same thing. We're looking at how do we get in and out of, well, yeah, but do you need more? That I guess that's the question. Maybe so, not you. Maybe not well, you. Maybe, maybe not me. Deal. Right, exactly. Yeah. If you can keep letting them roll in, I think you just got to yeah. from that standpoint. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that. I, I mean, I get it. Enough is not enough. I understand that. But I'm trying to come up with a segue to something that John mentioned earlier, and I'm failing drastically because the thing just popped up there. But let's forget the segue. All right. Looking at this. Can, can I say one thing? Yeah, Please I wanted do. to say something else, yeah. too. Frank. Go ahead, yeah. yeah. Let me, let me Girls, say, I, got, go. I got a quick sentence. A segue to Subway. <laughs> oh, ooh. Wait, where's the pen? Let me write that down. Oh, right, boy. Down. I just wanted to say that when you're talking about reporters asking questions, you know, it goes back. It used to be so different back in the day. And I remember there was a reporter for the Chronicle by the name of Lowell Cohn did not like Joe Montana. And he used to play gotcha with Joe Montana because yeah. Joe Montana was kind of like Belichick, if you remember. He wouldn't answer questions. He didn't like questions. He didn't like nosy reporters. And he right. did not like Low Cone at all. It was obvious. The Low Cone would ask him, so how did you do that? I got lucky. Yeah. So he got mad at Cone. Or, or Cone got mad at Montana. And all he would write after that, no matter what he did, was negative. Yeah. And I used to think, what a childish, excuse my French, no. bastard you are, yeah. Lil Cone. <laughs> the guy doesn't want to answer your questions. Leave him alone. You know, think of another angle. Get creative. And so then the flip side is a guy like Mike Ditka. The Chicago, some people in Chicago would go crazy when Ditka would do what he did, and some like me would love it. When a reporter would ask him a question, he'd look at him and go, that's about the dumbest question I've ever heard. <laughs> and I loved it. I thought, yeah. he's being real. He's being it's a real. dumb, how do you feel after losing that game 20 to 1 to 20? How am I? Do you think I feel great? Yeah. You know, how do you think I feel? Right. It's like somebody comes out of a fire holding their child's dying. How are you feeling right now? <laughs> yeah. It is about the clicks. That's, that's what right. it is. And it's even right. worse now. Now it's, a, now it's a game of gotcha. And it's worse now. Jim Gray would play the gotcha game. Right. He would drive me crazy sometimes, Frank. And one of the things that I found very interesting about him was when I used to go to the fights and his team would be there uh, with Albert scene and everything. For some reason, Jim was always eating by himself. Yes. I don't know what that meant. But <laughs> he wasn't part of the group with Al and Polly and uh, uh, the other guy, the main announcer. They would be over there and Jim would be by himself. So I wondered, I couldn't help but wondering, Jim kind of an asshole or what? I mean, you know, nobody yeah. wants to eat with him. I mean, it's kind of sad in a way. He's sitting way in the back by himself. He didn't seem to mind. So maybe he chose what he wanted, and that's what it was. Who was the guy that used to do golf? Jimmy, um, oh, I can't, can't remember. To do what? Jimmy, um, little little small guy on NBC. He did, he did oh, a lot of stuff. Oh, former football? No, not football. No, no. He did a lot of stuff, but I – Oh, anyway. yeah, Jimmy somebody. Right, right, little yeah. guy, yeah. J Charles knows who, because Charles has run across him before. Got kind he of went. an annoying voice. His voice is yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, I ran into him at the memorial, in, 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 uh, or actually the restaurant outside the memorial, on a really 
interesting date. That's another story entirely. Anyhow, um, the uh, he was there by himself after hours. Well, not really after hours, but they closed the kitchen. And he said, do you know who I am? You can open the kitchen. I'm like, dude, we don't not only do not know who you are, we don't care. The kitchen's closed. And you're like, I'm J- Jimmy Roberts. Is it Jimmy Roberts? I think yeah. that's it. Yeah, Jimmy, that's yeah. it. Yeah. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm on NBC. And I'm like, yeah, well, then you've got craft services over there. Get some food from them. You know, we there's a McDonald's right down the street. Our kitchen is closed. We don't have a chef. You can open the, dude, you're a little self-important there. You know, no <laughs> one's paying attention to you when you're on the air. You know, the golfers are the story, not you. So anyway, um, there, we've blown the segue. And anyone that has joined the Ultimate Sports Network to write for us in the last two weeks, ignore this entire segment. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, and I am not concerned about the clicks either. So I'm concerned about people actually getting the coverage that they deserve and actually coming back and getting more, not just going click, 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 and then pay attention to it. And I think that's also part of what's wrong with what we do. We pay per click and per Whatever view, but yeah, it's a view. society. It's a society yeah. thing, Frank. So right. in a way, it makes sense with what with the Deontay Wilder. Right. Oh, when he makes re- crazy comments, everybody pays attention and rips him. When he says something opposite of that, very classy, what people have been demanding from nobody cares. Right. There's the segment. Okay. Now there are a couple things that went under the radar in the last weekend that we're kind of surprised by, but maybe we shouldn't be. Um. Now. Charles, we've been on the J-Rock bandwagon here for a while, mm-hmm. and it may not be worth riding anymore. What do you think? Um, I mean, maybe not. It depends on the perspective. Um, I just don't know how you, he's been waiting to try to come back, and you get a shot and this opportunity, and he knows that he has to do well in order to try to get close to the upper echelon or even close to the bottom of the hill, right? And it just seems like he wasn't ready. I mean, yeah. he, he just didn't seem prepared. I don't know if he had a bad day, but it's like you waiting all this time and knowing where you want to be and you've lost your title, you want to be back there, and the only way you're going to do it is climb back up. I just don't understand how he wasn't prepared. And Hernandez was, uh, was, was a good fighter. He was busy. You know, he had some pop, showing you what was going on. But Julian Williams was – J-Rock is like – You've been you. I mean, you shocked the world a couple times. You've been a champion. I just don't know how he wasn't ready. Granted, bad days. I get that, but I just don't understand how he wasn't fired up to go. I got to get back on track to get wherever I'm at. It's almost like I don't want to put the same people in the same thing, but certain people you just. I mean, like if you saw after Lomachenko got beat by Love by Tiafimo Lopez, if he came out flat and lost, you'd be like. What in the hell happened? Right. You'd be shocked because you're like, we've known him. He's done some great things with Julian, you know, uh, you know, with J-Rock has done some great things before. So to see him, he almost seemed like he was he's just average. And and, I, and I'm trying to see, I don't understand losing a close fight, I'm with that. Right. But the way that he lost, I just don't comprehend how he wasn't better prepared. Well, this would this would be, in my opinion, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, that the Oscar Valdez we saw against Burchell came out, and then after, let's say he lost the title in a rematch or something like that, and then just went away. I mean, this guy looks like he's here to stay, and then he's not. And, I mean, I, when, when we saw Julian Williams, when he was doing well, we thought, okay, this guy's got a chance to be one of these guys. And now, like Charles said, this looks like an average guy. Is that uh, – I, I was thinking about this the other day. Is it maybe that the bubble has has robbed some people of a couple of years and and maybe it's just – or or the lack of a bubble or whatever? You're going, you know, he, his prime, we missed his prime. You know, I don't know. I don't – I actually differ from you guys a little bit. I watched the fight. I thought that for about three or four rounds, he looked good. Okay. And he hit – uh, Fernandez, right? Or Hernandez. What was Hernandez, it? Hernandez. Yeah. He hit him with everything. Solid. And he looked like he was on his way to the stoppage, but this guy was this guy was rocky. He just kept on coming. And and in the later rounds, William was gassed. Okay. And I think I think he just underrated him a little bit. I, I think he didn't I think you guys are partly, I agree with you guys partly. I think he 
didn't get himself fired up as much as he should have, didn't take it as seriously as he should have. He was in shape. He wasn't in the kind of shape that he expected this out of that guy. Right. So when he didn't knock him out early, because he hit him with some bombs. <laughs> I mean, I went, oh, and the guy didn't go. He didn't even yeah. buckle. He just kept on, and the guy was relentless, and the guy was hungry. And, and Julian didn't fight like he was hungry. He fought like, I mean, I didn't knock him out in the third round. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And yeah. by the ninth or tenth round, I got that sense. He was like, holy crap. And and Brad, you know, the guy I just mentioned, he's telling him, come on, you got to go. And, and I'm sitting there looking at Julie Williams, and I'm thinking, well, he's trying, but he no doesn't have that. anything right. anymore. Yeah. He's right. shot as, you know what, he's done. He's going to survive, obviously. And he got hit with some bombs mm-hmm. and survived. And I was just happy. I didn't was, I wouldn't have, let's see if I can explain this right. I wasn't happy that he lost. I was just happy that they gave it to the guy who won. Yeah. You know, I was worried that they would do one of these things that they tend to do so much in boxing that drives me nuts. They take it from the winner to give it to the name, and they did not. So, I, yeah, I just thought, I think that this maybe, maybe, if he's not past it, that's two in a row he's lost now. He's not past it. He can come back in his next fight, and if he doesn't look good in his next fight, yeah. Then we know that something definitely is wrong. He's not where he was, but he's still got time. Is what I'm trying to say. He can recover from 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 this loss and basically say, ah, "I was just an anomaly. Uh, you know, I, I just wasn't into it. Now I'm back into it." Well, and John, the same thing. Uh, remember when not too long ago we were t- not we, but the world was talking pound for pound, blah blah blah. Maybe we've got a, a, a true stallion here in, in Mikey Garcia, a guy that, you know, maybe if he's fighting the right weight class and all that stuff, this is the guy we're going to hang our hat on. And it, it, he's still getting fights, but we're wondering, at least I'm wondering, why is he still getting fights of, you know, I'm just not sure how to put it. You know, Mikey, Mikey is – I think all the inactivity caught up with him. You know, I, I've, I've said this a hundred times. I'll say it a hundred more times. He doesn't love boxing. It's not okay. his passion. He has admitted that. He, he's doing it for the money. And I think there's a difference when you, you, okay, you're obviously motivated by the money, but when you love what you do, it's a lot easier to get up at four o'clock in the morning right. to run than it is when you don't like it. You can talk right. yourself out of it. You can go, ah, I don't need it. Ah, I can beat this guy with my... With, with one arm tied behind my back. I, 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 I think and he's 33. And he, the mistake he made in my view, even though he wouldn't agree, but I don't care, is he should have stayed at 135 to 140. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he's not, he's only, he's only five foot six, but he doesn't carry the added weight very much. He certainly hasn't carried the power up. He was knocking people out like crazy. He's not even hurting anybody really anymore. Yeah. Not at 147 at least. At 140. He, looked, he looked thin at 135. Yes. Yes. And so I think, and then he took off two years, maybe, maybe longer. Yeah. And he did it again. That catches up with you when you get older, you know, and, and, and then you wonder about the fire in the belly. So he lost again. I was really surprised and happy that they gave it to the, to this European guy that mostly no one had heard of, you know, Stroller Martin. I mean, Sander Martin, you know, a movie <laughs> reference there. <laughs> you guys got it. But uh, you guys got it. No one else will, but they go, ooh. But uh, he won it, and I watched the fight, and he he won it. Even though the announcers were trying very hard for Mikey, uh, uh, Martin, Martin won it, and good for him. He said he was going to do it. I mean, fighters say that all the time, but he did it. He outboxed him. Simple as that. It was, cl- it was pretty close, though. It wasn't, it wasn't as wide as some people said. But, yeah, I, I think M- Mikey, in a sense, it has blown it in, his, is that, in, that, in that way. Not that he hasn't had an incredible career. He wanted to fight Josh Taylor next. Right. He wanted this to be a springboard to fight. Now, I thought, oh, okay, go back down to 140. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, he might end up still getting it, Frank. Like you were saying, why is he getting these fights? He's a name. He's a name, right. So there's there you go. Morons. I have morons on my team. That's another story. <laughs> um, the... And the interesting thing about that, being a name, and I am going to actually make a segue here, Charles, we have a name, at least we think he's a name, Shakur Stevenson going against Jamel Herring. Now, I'm looking at, at Boxrec, that's the thing that went off a little bit ago, and I'm looking at, at Boxrec, 
And I know that we know who Shakur Stevenson has fought or hasn't fought or how we're going to put it. But as I'm looking at it as the list, wow, this is a big fight for him because this is the first time he's really had to step up and, and go after somebody. So what does Shakur Stevenson bring to the table that his experience doesn't show? Wow. Um, just his overall boxing uh, acumen, right? His, his IQ, his acumen, his speed, his hands. Um, his, his, the IQ is major because uh, when you watch him fight, the way that he's able to stand back and kind of, you know, Floyd Mayweather-esque or someone else, a technician-esque, stand back and kind of look and, and, and channel what, he, what, what they had already talked about in Jim Forever and then take a shot. So it's like when you watch a guy throw a jab, he goes, and he waits, and then he hits, he throws a jab, and it's square on, even though the person tries to move. So with those intangibles that he's bringing to the fight, I mean, that's something that a record doesn't show. Plus, he's young, man, super young. And the only way that somebody young, we saw it, go back to Oscar De La Hoya's of the world, the, you know, the Johnny Tapia's, you know, even the Tony Ayala's back in the day. I mean, they were green, man. Guys were green. <laughs> and you look at the resume early on, you're like, well, who the hell has he fought? Right. Doesn't He's matter. Young. Right. Right. He has to get out there. And this is one of probably his first real tests. We're going to find out if he's the real deal. So granted, I mean, to look at the resumes now, you could probably do that for a lot of guys. If you look at their resume, the first 12, 13, 14, right. even first 20 fights, you go, hell, I'm looking at some people at the first 35, and I'm still like, who the fuck is he fought? Terrence Crawford. Right. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, boo. Very subliminal. <laughs> But I'm just saying, I mean, no, that, that's that's way off kilter. I'm sorry, I apologize. But anyway, the point of it is he's young, real, super young, and at some point he has a test. So if you're looking for a, 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 a formidable or a dominant name on that, that uh, resume early on, you might be searching a long time. But that's why we had the fights. This is legitimate. This is somebody that really is going to, supposed to challenge him. This is somebody that He's going to have to work. He can't walk in there and be cute and say, oh, I'm dating your sister, and I'm going to beat the hell out of you. It's not that kind of thing. I know you're mad. but nothing you can do about it. This is a legitimate, a formidable opponent that uh, it's going to be a real test. And then after this one, you will have at least one name on there that you can say, wow, that was a test. Well, and looking at it on the other side of it, we've got Herring, who were – I, I don't know how we're looking at it because, okay, who's he fought or who did he fight when, when they were there? You know, the last fight was Carl Frampton and Carl Frampton wasn't the Carl Frampton we've seen before. You know, Ito was not maybe the Ito that we had seen before. It, it's like, he always seems to get guys and maybe he makes them look like they're about ready to be retired. Maybe that's it, but he doesn't seem to get anybody was like, aha, I got that guy right at the prime. So which Jamel Herring are we going to see? I think we'll see the best. I, I, I don't think he can. I don't think he'll be able to handle secure. I, I, secure has something to prove now more than before. I think because for, for one of the first, maybe the first time in his career, some people are always going to be critical. But in his last fight, even though he dominated, he got criticized. He didn't score a knockout. He didn't do this. And I see, I, I always find that ridiculous criticism. That's just being nitpicky as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I know it's the entertainment business and all that, but he won 10 or 11 out of 12 rounds. Come on, man. Yeah. They said that Monday Night Football. What, what do you want? He didn't get the knockout that you wanted so badly. Yeah, he gets bored in there because he's so much better than everybody. He is that word that Charles loves so much. That C word, not the nasty one. The crafty. He, <laughs> he is. He is crafty. I mean, I love the kid. I'll admit, I, as my son says on uh, 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 Fields, Bears quarterback, I got a man crush on Shakur Stevenson. I'll say that. I mean, I, I think he I think he is so talented that he hasn't even tapped into all of it. He's not even close yet. He's probably about 50% into his talent, maybe 60 at the most. He and The thing that worries me, though, only that worries me, is that he'll lose only because he, he, he decides that he wants to please everybody. Yeah. Not gonna lose, but I'm just saying if it ever happens, yeah. that'll be the reason because people will be going, Oh yeah, you're you're 28, no, but you haven't stopped anybody in your last four fights. Oh, so what? Right. And if I was his management team, that's what I would be saying. 
that's what I always said about his former manager, Andre Ward. You don't have to knock any, everybody out. F them. You're winning. You're winning. You're dominating. I think he'll be primed. I think he's going to try to stop Herring, and I think he might. I do. I think he's going to be the best we've seen. No, I'm not really going out. I don't think I'm going out on a limb. I just think they're both going to be primed. Shakur is just better. He's younger. He's faster. Take him a few rounds to figure him out, and then he'll just start beating him up. Charles, I'm going to use a football reference and see if this makes sense. Shakur Stevens is like watching prime Le'Veon Bell run with the Steelers. Be quick, but don't be fast. Read your options and then start from basically standstill to boom, get there. And that's why I see in Shakur Stevens. He doesn't necessarily have to be first, though he is, but he just reads what's going on. And then before you know it, he strikes. I can see that. But let my reference be, I thought, I thought in that football reference, I'd probably say more Ezekiel Elliott. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Very similar, but that point of, as you said, especially with the burst. But you're right. He doesn't have to be that way. He just has to be uh, take care, let the skill set, trust the skill set, wait, be patient, wait, and then use the philosophy where he sees the weakness and attack. I mean, for as we talk about uh, about uh, Floyd all the time, Junior, but that was his philosophy oftentimes too. He just waited for you to make a mistake, and then he will punish you. It wasn't anything that was elaborate. Most people think, yeah, the defense and the you know the shoulder roll and all that was one thing. But it was very simple. He waited, he executed, something didn't work, make some twists and some changes, and you execute. And I think that's what's going to help Shakir Stevenson in this fight and down the line if he stays with it. Because the boxing IQ is like in sports and basketball or even in football. If you're, you know, you got to, uh, it depends on somebody, they're playing a, a cover two and you know where the open spaces are, you know, the tight end will shoot there in the middle hit him all day long. You got a Mark Andrews in there. Why the hell are you trying to go down, down the field to Hollywood Brown when you can just, you know, kill him, you know, walk him down and kill him slowly. It's the same route. And it's the same point of winning the same way with, did you execute in, in, in boxing? You know, you find a weakness, you, you, uh, you, you execute and, and you make them, uh, make them try to change because you are the smarter fighter. And I think that, the majority of times when Shakir Stevenson, if he keeps on this path, that he's more likely, 90, uh, 85% of the time, he's going to be the smarter fighter with uh, with great skills. Did you just reference the Baltimore Ravens passing game and something positive? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wait, 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 wait a minute. Before you get there, you can say it if you want to. You can oh, I agree. You can I agree completely. As I say, my man Marmar, he has two damn options. He got a tight end and he got a, a little dude that's about five, six on a good day and his feet. And they and, and, they, are, and, and, and they are running. He's running and they make it happen. Everybody's like, how the hell did you? Oh, how did you beat them? Uh, dudes, like, more and more, it's like, y'all don't, y'all don't know me. A string running backs and running them down your, I mean, it's it's amazing. So this is the idea of you use the, the mindset, the, the pattern of what you're going to come up with, regardless of how everyone else thinks it's going to work. This is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. So this is how we're going to do it. And this, I think, played out well with Fury Wilder. Wilder had a plan. Fury had a better plan. In this fight, John, who do you think, just from what we've seen, has a better plan? Because he's such a natural, I'm always going to go with Stevenson. Uh, Harry might think he has a plan. Stevenson is the guy that will adapt to whatever is going on. I mean, a quick story that I had never heard. Maybe you guys have, and I hope it's true. I heard that Floyd Mayweather, speaking of Floyd, who we mentioned a lot, spotted Shakur Stevenson when he was like 15 or 16 and said, oh, God, we got to sign this kid. Mm -hmm. He watched him for 10 seconds, so we have to sign him. He saw what we're talking about then. Mm -hmm. So I'm always going to think that even if Herring might have a, a plan, because I think they sparred. I think I read that they sparred. And, uh, she, of course, there's always a difference of opinion on who did better. Right. But I would, you know, sparring is so hard. Unless somebody gets mad or, or gets angry or reading or done it, angry and they start really going at it. But they're sparring. They're working on something. So it's, it's different. 
but uh, I'm, I'm always, I, I, I don't, I think the plans, obviously it's easy to say Stevenson like I first did, but now I'm rethinking it. Might, they both might have really solid plans. But my point is, is that Stevenson will be the guy that if that plan, he's having a little issue with Perry's length or his, his, uh, his caginess, you know, the old veteran, right? He's going to be able to adapt faster, even though he might be least, uh, not as experienced as a professional, right. just because of his natural ability. That's what I'm saying. So I don't know if it's imp really important who has a better plan. You know, that thing we always say, you know, everyone has a plan until they get hit. I mean, and that, yeah, that's, that's very true. But uh, I, th I just think that Stevenson will be able to, to off the fly, you know, just, just go with whatever the flow is and change what he's doing to make it work for him. So it's probably equal on that, but Stevenson is the, he's the natural. I'll tell you, I would call him the natural if it was me. Well, Charles, as we're looking at how it plays out, and how you think, well, okay, well, let's go that way. Prediction time. What do you think is going to happen? How does it play out? Uh, I'm going to go, this is a little bit bizarre because it's out there, but to hell with it. I'm going to go with uh, Shakir Stevenson with a KO in the ninth round. Okay. If, if it goes that far. Because I think what's going to happen is they're going to start, and I think Herring is going to try to be more the aggressor, kind of be more the, the bully because he's older and physical, right? And then I think what's going to happen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it to six then. Let's go six. Because I think Shakira's going to start six. I was going to go nine. I'm going to go six. Because now in my mind, I'm envisioning Shakira Stevenson hitting you with that pop, pop, with the, with yeah. the body shots that he likes to do. And then he hits you with it like he's turning the glove like it's a, 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 a hook or something. Yeah. Pop, pop. And then he starts going to the head. So I think that's what's going to happen. So Oh, I might have to think about that. John's been a like gambler lately. I might have to look, you know, I might have to look at six or nine just to kind of see what my odds are. But uh, I'm probably going to say six or nine. Uh, it could go deeper, but I think uh, that the factor that, as John mentioned earlier, the way that that last fight ended, the way that people were so-called not impressed, if you will, and it went longer than a lot of people thought, I think it'll come even sharper and try to go, let's put this guy to sleep. Let's go to work and let's end this early so they can put some speck back on their name, on my name, as they say in the wire. Put some speck on that man's name in six or nine is what I'm calling. All right, John, what do you think of Mr. Cruel Shoes at Aqueduct in the six? Oh, never mind. Um, <laughs> uh, how do you see it turning out? You know, it's funny. I agree with Charles. I, if I went ahead and cut out of that website, I'd, I'd be thinking about put money in one of those. I was thinking the eighth round. So I don't know what it, I think. It, it, I, I do know what I'm thinking is that they said they, they who were criticizing him said he could have taken out his last opponent anytime he wanted. So I think that this time it's possible that if he gets Herring in trouble, instead of waiting like he tends to do, he'll go in and try to finish him. And that's where I said he could, he might get clipped, but he's going to have to do that. I, well, he doesn't have to do anything. That's the thing about craziness about this sport is that you have to win. You shouldn't have to impress everybody and his brother, but I think his mindset's going to be okay. If I hurt him, I wobble him. I'm going to stop him. So I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking a little, a little past six. I'm thinking the eighth round later. Obviously, the easy pick is him by decision. And the chances of that happening are very good. But I don't know. I just got a feeling too that he's gonna he's gonna be loading up a little bit more than usual, and he's gonna catch Herring with some shots that is and and it'll be angles. He won't because here's not a big puncher, and he's only got eight knockouts. But right. he's gonna be right. He's so fast, it's gonna come from somewhere that Herring doesn't see it, and then he'll get clocked, and that that'll do it. Well, I think that we're we are finally back on that track of. Let's start getting good fights on a weekly basis. We're getting there. You know, I think we finally got to the, all right, the big one is out the way. Let's go. So I think we're in good shape here. I think it's something that's going to play out very well. Um, I'm not going to make a prediction because that's not my job. It's your job. And also, I'm not even sure what the hell I'm thinking, to tell you the truth. I, I agree with you guys a little bit, but I'm looking more of a decision. I think Harry's going to give him a little bit more of a, a run for his money. Want well, bet? it's not that's, that's even a, a, a close decision. Want to bet? <laughs> I thought that's what we were doing. Like that, John. 
what, what, what's the what's the parlay now? So, all right, before before we go, um, it, it's been an interesting ride for the last few weeks, and I think it's going to get even better coming up. So, thanks again. We will uh, check you all later, and as always, we say something stupid at the end to close the show. Bye bye.